on earth before he raised on Resurrection Sunday and next week. And so we just want to look a bit, a little bit about what happened during that week, uh, which is called, uh, most people call it Passion Week, uh, sometimes it's called Holy Week. Uh, but there's a week from Sunday to Sunday. And so we're going to look at a few. We weren't, we're not going to do an in-depth study. I just want to give you an overview about what happened that last week from Sunday to Sunday. So let's look at that. Uh, Passion Week. Uh, what we call Palm Sunday. Today is technically what most people call Palm Sunday. Why do they call it Palm Sunday? Uh, we're not Catholic, so we're not <laughs> you know, taking a name from Catholic or anything. We call it Palm Sunday because that's the... When Jesus came into Jerusalem, they laid down palm branches and their clothes on the ground and uh, received him as though he was a you know a king coming back from battle in victory. Okay? And so that's why we call it uh, the triumph entry or, or Palm Sunday because they laid down palms on the ground, to the branches to usher him, the king, in. And so that was Sunday, the Sunday before his resurrection Sunday. Now things uh, changed during the week. So on Sunday, they were hailing him, Hosanna, blessed is he to come into the name of the Lord. And, and then on Friday, they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. You know, So they uh, changed there a little bit. But he did come in to Jerusalem in victory and triumphant. And uh, that's called, what we call Palm Sunday. And if you want to read these, we're not going to read these passages, but if you want to look it up yourself, in Matthew chapter 21, verse uh, 1 through 11. And then Monday... Uh, starts off with, in verse uh, 18 of chapter 21 of Matthew, uh, he cursed the fig tree on his way into the city, into Jerusalem. Uh, he cursed the fig tree. He went to the fig tree, he was hungry, he went to the fig tree, and the fig tree didn't have any fruit, and so he said, may no fruit grow on you from now on. And then he went to Jerusalem and overlooked Jerusalem and prayed and you know wept over Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would I'd like to take you like a hen gathers your chicks, but you would not. And so you were condemned. Okay, so and then he went to the temple and cleansed the temple. This is the second time that he did such thing. And he went and he cleansed the temple. He chased all the money changers out and things like that, uh, because it was a, they were turning the house of God into a house of merchandise and a house of not only a house of merchandise, a house of cheating and things like that, making, making money. Uh, and so he cleansed the temple on Monday, and then on Tuesday. Uh, and back on their way past the tree that they had just passed yesterday, they cursed. The disciples noticed that it was withered, and withered up. And so the, the, the curse the fig tree on the way. Amen. Oh, this is supposed to say it. <laughs> I, I think I made a mistake and copied the other one. But I supposed to say they saw the tree that was withered. It was the one that you said cursed. Um, Anyway, so, and then uh, in chapter 24 of Matthew, uh, it's Jesus' response to his disciples' question about, will you now, at this time, uh, bring your kingdom to earth? And Jesus told him them some of the things that happen in the future. So Matthew chapter 24 is a prophecy of future things that would happen in response to the disciples' questions. And then on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, Judas went to the priests and agreed with them to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Okay, and so he planned that. And then Thursday. Thursday's where things really get moving. On Thursday, um, Jesus told his disciples to go prepare him a room for the Passover, and then they gathered together at the Passover meal, and they, they uh, celebrated the Passover. And then Jesus identified his betrayer, one that he dips sop in, you know, the bread and sop and gives it to him, will be the betrayer. And, and Judas says, this devil entered to Judas, and he said, Jesus said, what I do is do quick. And he said, devil, and Jesus, and Judas went out and uh, planned, went and get the soldiers and planned to go uh, arrest Jesus. But then that night, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. And uh, in a little bit, we'll look at uh, the passage in Corinthians that identifies what Jesus had told his disciples in Matthew chapter 26, and we'll look at that also in a little bit when we have the Lord's Supper today. But that's where he changed the Passover, which was a picture of what he would do when he came, with sacrifice and shed his blood on the cross for us. And that was the Passover was a ceremony that predicted, that looked forward to Christ's um, coming 
as the Messiah. And then the past, the uh, the Lord's Supper was instituted to look back, to do in remembrance of me. And so we're looking back. So the Passover looks forward to the cross. The Lord's Supper looks back to the cross. Okay, so Christ instituted the Lord's Supper here, changed the Passover from going forward to looking backwards, looking forward to looking backwards, because he was going to fulfill uh, what the Passover pre you know, pre predicted and, and symbolized, and then instituted the Lord's Supper to remember that. And then Friday. Friday is a big, big, big day. Okay? Um, start, Friday started at midnight, um, and so Jesus didn't get any rest from Thursday all the way to he was crucified on Friday. But it's called Good Friday. Um, I often wonder why it was called Good when that was the day that Jesus was crucified. Uh, but it is good because that's how God provided salvation for us, even though it was not good as far as what men did to him. It is good that he provided salvation. So at uh, 12, they went out when they left the uh, where they were gathered to have the Passover and the Lord's Supper. They left there and went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Judas knew that Jesus would go off into the Garden of Gethsemane and pray. And he knew that he would be there. So Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And then Judas brought those who would capture Jesus, arrest Jesus. And he brought them and betray Jesus with a kiss. He said, the one I kiss, that's the one of Jesus, you know, and so um, he was taken and um, Jesus was taken to Annas first uh, and then, and because he was the former high priest, he was the father, uh, father-in-law, I think it is, of the, of the current high priest, and then after that he was taken to uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, and then uh, Peter, remember Peter when Jesus said, you know, today you would deny me thrice. And he goes, I will never deny, I will die for you. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he did. He denied him. But, uh, so Peter denied him. And then uh, the Sanhedrin condemned Jesus. The Sanhedrin were the rulers of the people. Uh, they were the, the priests, the rulers of the priests, and the rulers of the people. Uh, all condemned Jesus to death. He said he needs to be executed. Crucify him. And then also that night, Judas went out and hanged himself, it says. Now, if you read, there's two accounts of Judas's death in the Bible. One says that he hanged himself, he went out and hanged himself and died. And the other one said he fell down from a cliff headlong and burst open in the mist and died. You know, and so which is it, you know? It, they're both true. You put them both together. He, he went up evidently on a cliff and there's a tree hanging over the cliff and he hung himself on the tree and then the rope broke, broke, broke and he fell down and so and busted and opened and died. Uh, and so those, those are not inconsistent stories. They're the same one story. One is to say, tells it from one perspective and another from another perspective. But, but Judas committed suicide. He hung himself because he realized what he had done. He, he went tried to you know, go back to chief priest and say, here's the money back. You know, I don't want anything to do with it. It's too late. You already did it. You know? We don't care about you. We never cared about justice. We just wanted an you know, opportunity to get him, and we, now we're going to get him because of you. We're going to crucify him because of you. And maybe Judas understood that. And said, I was greedy, and I wanted the money, and I wanted the money more than my the master, and now he's going to die because of me, and I don't know. But Jesus, Judas went out and, and hung himself, and you know, he fell down and busted open, it says, and his bowels moved out, so, or come out. So um, Judas commits as I died. And then at 6 a.m., Jesus was taken before Pilate and uh, Judge Mahal. And then from there, he was taken over to King Herod and then back to Pilate. That's from Matthew 27, and 2 through 4, he was at, from Pilate. And then Luke records he went over to Herod in uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 8 through 12. And then back over to Pilate in Matthew 27, 15 through 23. Uh, and then they whipped Jesus. They mocked him. The soldiers planted a crown of thorns on his head and mocked him and says, you know, and they hit him with a reed. And they said, prophet, like, who, 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 who hit you? Tell us who hit you. If you're, you know, if you're really a prophet, tell you. Jesus could have told him. He knew. <laughs> but he said, Father, forgive them. Remember, he wasn't uh, there to condemn them. He was there to die. So, so they whipped Jesus and they mocked him. And then um, Jesus was crucified. Um a crown of thorns on his head, and they crucified him. Uh, and they put him on the cross at, um, and then at 9 o'clock, I'm sorry, at 12 o'clock, it became dark for three hours, 12 o'clock until uh, he died at 3 p.m. Um, 
it was dark, three hours of darkness. Now, it wasn't, any, you know, some people try to, you know, there's, there's, all, there's people that always don't want to believe the Bible and don't want to believe miracles, and so they make excuses for miracles, you know. I heard one time this uh, guy explaining Jesus walking on the water and coming to the disciples out in the boat. They go, well, you see, Jesus knew where these big lilies were, and so he would step on these lilies all the way out to the boat. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so Peter got on a lily and then he got off the lily. <laughs> it's, it's so stupid, you know. I think it would be more of a miracle for Jesus to be able to walk on the lily all the way out to the boat than to, <laughs> you know, actually walking out there. Um, and so, you know, Jesus is... <laughs> Miracles were, the things associated with Jesus' life were miracles. They were miraculous uh, evidences of God's working. And so it was dark. It became dark because the spiritual condition was dark. The Son of Man was giving his life on the cross of Calvary, and men were crucifying him and condemning him who was not, who was perfect, and he was dying in their place. All right, and so he was crucified, and he died at three, about 3 p.m., and uh, when he died, it says that the temple veil was rent from, was torn from the top to the bottom. That's what the Bible says, from top to the bottom. I don't know, I don't know if you can, you know, if you rip something and I say, which, how did I tear this, from top to bottom or bottom to top? I don't know if you could tell. I mean, maybe you, if you were a scientist and you had a magnifying glass, but I don't think that they, how do, you, how do they know? I'm sure there was a witness. There was somebody that was standing there and, look, it's ripping, you know, all the way down and ripped from top to bottom. And that was to indicate that the separation that keep us from God was accomplished and where our salvation was accomplished and now we have the ability to come before the Lord and we have a, a our, you know, righteousness is procured by Christ's righteousness. This is death on the cross. Okay? Um, we became, he became sin for us and we understand that we might be made the righteousness of God in him and so we are righteous in Christ and we have direct access to God. All right, and so, um, and that's Friday. And then on Saturday, uh, the Pharisees asked for a guard for Jesus, too. Remember, they said, uh, well, then his disciples come steals steal his body and say he rose in. That'll, that'll be worse than before. Everybody will believe in him, you know. And so um, Pilate gave them a guard, and they put a guard in the tomb, which actually turned out to be good because the, the soldiers who were not Christians, okay, testified the fact that Jesus was risen. They saw the angel there and they understood that he was risen from the dead. Um, and so, but the Pharisees got their guard and, uh, but then Jesus rose and the stone was rolled away. The stone wasn't rolled away to let him out. Okay. The stone was rolled away to show he wasn't there. Okay? So when Mary and Mary Magdalene came to the tomb to, to anoint Jesus' feet or whatever, they, they said, how are we going to roll away the stone? They got there and it was already rolled away. And they went and they saw that his body was not there. He was risen already. And so the stone was rolled away to prove that he was risen. But I'm sorry, did I get ahead of myself? <laughs> Saturday he was still in the tomb. And then Sunday he rose and they came to the tomb on Sunday, Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday, and they found the tomb empty. And uh, Jesus' disciples, uh, Jesus appeared to his disciples that day also, and that's recorded in Matthew 28, um, verse 8 through 10. And so this is the, the events that led up to the resurrection and culminated in the resurrection. Uh, the disciples were, uh, you know, excited that Jesus was going to, you know, the, on, in chapter 20, uh, what chapter was it, 21, they asked him, you know, were you going to be, set up your kingdom now? Are we going to rule and reign with you right now, tomorrow? Are they going to become... You know, we're going to become, you know, under you. We're going to rule the world. You know, they thought about it. And then all of a sudden, Jesus was crucified. And they're like, oh, what? what? We didn't no, 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 no. This blows out our plans. You know, they didn't understand that. But then when he rose and they understood God's plan, uh, they were excited. And, and Acts chapter 2 records uh, that, the power that they, they received, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Okay? Now, so that's just an overview of this week. So as you go throughout the week, Sunday, today is Palm Sunday. So uh, today, if Jesus, you know, if you're, this was 2020, 2000, well, almost 2,000 years because he was 33 years old when he was crucified. Uh, but he was born in 80, like 6, so, or 5 or 6, so it's not exactly 1 to 1. Um, but when Jesus was 33 years old, he was crucified. So when he was 33 years old today, 
was Palm Sunday. They, they said, you know, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So they, he was coming into Jerusalem today, and then, you know, Monday this happened, Tuesday this happened, and the next Sunday he was resurrecting Sunday, and so that's probably one of the most um, exciting days of our remembrance. We remember Christ's birth, which is wonderful, uh, that he came, but he came to die, and he raised from the dead to accomplish salvation. He couldn't stay dead because you had victory over death came to uh, die for us and have victory over death. And so, but the last question I'll look at is, why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? If somebody asks you, why did Jesus die? What would you say? You know, I know that a lot of people who aren't Christians like, I don't understand, why did Jesus have to die? Why didn't God say, okay, I forgive you. <laughs> done, you're done, it's forgiven. No harm, just, I forgive you. Yeah, that makes sense maybe from a human perspective who are unrighteous, but from God's perspective, who is a righteous God, sin has to be punished. Justice and righteousness require that sin be punished. And God had said to Adam and Eve, chapter 1 of Genesis, way back in the beginning when he first created them, before sin entered, sin entered the world, he had said, if you, the day that I eat is there, thou shalt surely die. He said, the consequence of disobeying me is death. Okay? Now, I'm sure that they didn't, they've never seen death, so maybe they didn't know exactly what it was, but they knew it was bad, and Eve repeated it to the devil. Remember when she's, you know, the devil came to her, has God said, oh, you're not going to die. And she goes, yeah, he said, we're going to die. That's what he said, we're going to die. She knew. She knew what he had said, okay? So death is the result. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But why did Jesus have to die? I'm going to give you four reasons today, real quick, and before we take the Lord's Supper. Number one, Jesus died because God loves us. Okay? In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved the world, so he gave his only begotten Son. What does that mean, give his only begotten Son? He's not talking about the birth of Christ. He's talking about the death of Christ. He gave him as a substitute for us as our Savior, to pay for our sins in our place. That's what that give is talking about, you know. Um, you know, and Obviously, Jesus was given to us in birth, but he was given to us in death because we, we don't get saved by believing in his birth. Okay? If you, you, don't, you can't say, oh, I believe in Christ's birth, and so I'm a Christian. <laughs> no, you're not. You have to believe in his death and his resurrection. Okay? And that, that, for, that was effective for you. So, God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son in death, that. And so, if his death provided salvation, if we believe in him, we should not perish, we have everlasting life. And so, God loved us is why Jesus had to die. Jesus had to die because God loved us. Now, I heard somebody, a liberal, liberal preacher, getting up and says, um, I wish nobody would say anything about the second part of the verse. Just say, for God so loved the world. Isn't that wonderful? God loves you and he cares for you. He is so loving you so much. And forget the rest of the verse, okay? But the rest of the verse, God's love for us doesn't have any meaning. If we can sin, he says, I love you anyway. It's okay. You can sin. It's all right. I'll forgive you. Then God is meaningless. His love is meaningless, you know? Because he's not righteous. He's not holy. He's not a just God, okay? So God so loved the world. But his love for us caused him to send Christ to die for us. That's how he loved us. That's how he showed his love toward us, in that Christ died for us. And so he loved us, and as a result of him loving us, he sent Christ to die for us. It's not, it's not like he loved us and it's okay. And it's, you know, I think people confute God's love with our emotion. You know, He just he was so emotionally tied to you he just was bring you brought him such joy and pleasure and when he thought about you he was all warm and fuzzy that's not what god that's not what love is first of all okay that's not true love uh, and second of all that's not what god says when he he didn't say you know when god so loved the world he has a fuzzy warm feeling about the world no he understood the world is sinners okay he his love was for those who are unworthy of his love but but the people who think you know god loves us they say it in the way that we deserve God's love. You know, we're so lovable. God loved us because we are so valuable and so lovable. So, of course, God loves us because we are lovable. No, we're not. God's love for us is a, uh, is, is, depicts his goodness, not ours. All right, so 
but God, Jesus had to die for us because God loved us. Second of all, Jesus died, had to die because we are sinners. Men are sinful. Men are sinners. The Bible says, or is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. Nobody has ever been righteous. We are all born in sin, and we are all commissioned, and we have all committed sin. And so there's none righteous. And then verse 23 of the same chapter, Romans chapter 3 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we, we just usually read Romans chapter uh, 3, verse 23, but if you go on and read your 24, 25, 26, all down, it says, it talks about the sinfulness, you know, how sinful we are. And so God, Jesus had to die for us because we are sinners. That's why he died, because we are sinners. Not because he's a sinner, but because we are sinners. In John chapter 3, verse 18, or John 3, 16, says that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. But verse 18 goes on and says, And he that believeth in him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the Son, the only begotten Son of God. So we are already condemned. We are already condemned. We are already on our way to hell. We are already, as far as God is concerned, we deserve to go to hell. And if nothing happens, we will go to hell. And that's the just consequences of our sin. And so God, Jesus had to die because we are sinners. And then number three, Jesus had to die because the wages of sin is death. That's why he had to die. Because God said, the day thou eatest thou, thou shalt surely die. Okay? So the consequence of sin must be death. But Jesus died in our place, in our stead, for us. Now, of course, as you know, death is not only physical death, but spiritual death and eternal death. The wages of sin is each. Uh, the Bible says uh, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, you're talking about here not only physical death, not only spiritual death, but eternal death. Okay, So, Christ experienced that death for us. So, he had to die because I had to die. So, it was either I have to die for my own sin and be separated. You know, death is separation. When our body and our soul is separated, we are physically dead. Uh, our soul doesn't cease to exist and our body doesn't cease to exist. We just got separated, okay? Our soul goes somewhere where our body is not. And our body is a soulless, lifeless body now. But our, our body doesn't disintegrate and disappear when we die, you know? You see those things that, you know, in Star Trek where they shoot you, you know, and they're gone, you just vaporize. And, you know, your, your, your body still say, you know, when you, when you die, your body doesn't change. It starts changing, you know, and corrupting, but it doesn't change, you know, into something else. It's... Your soul just simply leaves your body. And your soul doesn't cease to exist. Your body doesn't cease to exist. They just get separated. And that's what death is, separation. So physical death is our soul and our body are separated. And our soul goes somewhere. And our body stays somewhere else. And then at the rapture, our body will be reunited with our soul. Our body will be changed and we get a new body. But it's a body that will be reunited with our soul. But, so uh, physical death is a result of a consequence of sin. Uh, spiritual death is a consequence of sin. What is spiritual death? It's separation that occurs between us and God. You know, the unity that we had, the fellowship we had, the relationship we had before sin, that sin cut that relationship. There was no unity. There was no communication. There was no fellowship. There was no peace with God. Okay? And that's what, that's what is called spiritual death. Okay? When we are, we're divided, we're separated from God, Spiritually, that's spiritual death. And then there's eternal death. Like it says here, eternal life, there's eternal death. That means we're being separated from God forever. In other words, God is in heaven. Where we'll be in hell. We'll be separated from God forever and ever and ever. And so there will never be any restoration of the relationship between us and God. No possibility of restoration. There's a possibility now. We trust Christ, and in Christ we can have eternal life. But once you experience eternal death, that's permanent. And so that's why it's so important to uh, help people to understand this right. Some people, even though they understand, they won't accept it, but at least they understand it. And so some who, some will. So that's this is the gospel. But so the wages of sin is death. That's why Christ had to die to pay the penalty of our sins for us. And then he had to die because we had to have a substitute. He died in our place. Now, we read these verses last week in 
connection with our Sunday school time, but let me just read them real quick again. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. Let's see if it is there. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So God put our sins upon him who knew no sin. That's what the Second uh, Corinthians 5, 12 says. For he, as God, made him, as Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. So Christ wasn't a sinner. He didn't sin. He never committed any sin. He never became a sinner. Don't, let, don't ever let anybody tell you that Christ became a sinner in our way. No, he never became a sinner. He was always a holy, righteous, sinless son of God. Okay, And God incarnate. He never changed that. Nothing changed in that area. He just bore the consequence of our sin. Okay? The consequence of our sin, the payment that was required for our sin was death. And so he paid the requirement sin for, for sin for us. See? So God made him to be sin for us who knew sin that we might be made the righteous of God in him. So I don't actually become righteous when I trust Christ as my Savior. I become righteous positionally. Okay? Christ's righteousness is applied to sinful me. Just like sinful my, my sins from sinful me is applied to righteous Christ, Christ's righteousness is applied to sinful me. And his righteousness covers me. And when God looks at me, he sees righteousness of Christ. And so he accounts Christ's righteousness to me just like he accounted our punishment to Christ. Okay? And then 1 Peter chapter 4, For as much then as Christ has, has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. So Christ suffered for us in the flesh, for us. Okay? Galatians 1, 4, uh, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. And then 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for, uh, for all to be testified in due time. And then Romans chapter 5, verse 8, For God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us okay, in our place. Romans 8, 20 to 32, uh, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. So it was for us he was dying. How shall he not with him also agree to give us all things? And then 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. I purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And Christ was our substitute for us. And then Galatians 3, 13. For Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. In our place. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. And then Titus 2.14, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purge unto, uh, purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And then John chapter 11, verse 50, For consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. Okay, so one man died for the people. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 10, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live uh, together with him. And then Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And then finally, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. We'll look at John 3, 16, but 1 John 3, 16 says, Whereby perceive we the love of God, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, that we and we ought also lay down our lives for our brethren. Okay? Just like Christ laid down his life for us, we should lay down our life for the brethren, he says. And so Christ died for us. And so why did Christ have to die? Because God loved us. Christ had to die because God loved us, because we are sinners. And we had to die, but Christ died in our place. And then uh, number three, Christ had to die because the wages of sin is death. That's the consequence of sin. And then finally, Christ died in our place as a substitute. That's why he had to die, because I had to die. If I didn't have to die, then he wouldn't have to die. But I had to die, and so he had to die in my place for me, okay, to pay the penalty of sin. So that's what Christ did upon the cross. And he satisfied the just wrath of God 
against this just wrath against sinners. He paid the penalty of our sins. And so let's remember that this week. You know what Christ did? He suffered and he died for me. Everything he did that week, he did for me and for you and for those who trust Christ our Savior. Who would come later who trust Christ our Savior. He, he went. He suffered through all that. And if you look at the whole, you know, if you read, uh, if you get, have you ever uh, looked at a um, synoptic gospels? These are gospels that all the, all the record of the different records of the same event in the New Testament, the gospels is written side by side. So like if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all say that Jesus did something, it would be side by side and, and it would record that. And so good to look at a synoptic gospel, maybe a uh, Bible, and, and see all these things that Christ did um, throughout the week for us. He did it all for us. He suffered and he died for us, for you and for me. And so let's praise God for that. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that Christ uh, gave on our behalf dying on the cross to pay for our sins for us. We thank you so much. And now as we come into the time of uh, remembrance, like you commanded, we partake of this Lord's Supper. We will help each of us to look into our heart to make sure we understand that we are sinners, that we don't deserve salvation, but Christ uh, has provided that. And you help us to look into our hearts to make sure that we aren't denying him in some way and, and pray that you'd help us to if there's any sin in our life, to confess that, to get it right with you, so that we can have an open fellowship with you and partake in these elements of the Lord's Supper in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we want to take a, partake of the Lord's Supper real quick, but first of all, let me just uh, say a little bit of, about the Lord's Supper. Um, just the history of the Lord's Supper. You know, the, in the Old Testament, uh, there was the Passover, and uh, the Passover was commemorated God's salvation for Israel out of Egypt. And the blood of the Lamb was applied. Uh, the death angel would pass over. That's why it's called the Passover. The angel would pass over. Uh, but Christ has become our Passover. In 1 Corinthians, we read this, but in chapter 5, verse 7 says, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And so, the Passover commemorated the fact that one day, the Spotless Lamb of God would come and shed His blood for you and for me and pay the penalty of our sins. And so the Passover was them looking forward to the cross. And the Lord's Supper is looking back to the cross. And I said we'd look at this in a little bit, but Matthew chapter 6, 26, uh, Jesus, when He instituted the Lord's Supper, He said this in verse 26 through 30, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for remission of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew, drink it new with you in the in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung, sung a hymn, they went out uh, into the mountain. Mount of Olives, into the Mount of Olives. So Christ said, uh, He instituted the Lord's Supper. He changed the Passover into the Lord's Supper. He said, Take, eat this. This bread is, represents my body. And this drink, this cup, represents my blood. Right? The bread symbolizes Christ's body, which was crucified for us. And the cup symbolizes Christ's blood, which was shed for us. Partaking of the bread and the cup symbolizes our participation in His death. It's a symbol. Okay, and we'll say a little bit about that in a minute. Okay, So we looked at the history of the Lord's Supper. Now let's look at the, pra uh, the practice of the Lord's Supper. And uh, Paul commands us to uh, do the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse 23 through 30. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord this Jesus, the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, "This is the cup. This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat the bread and drink the cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood and the body and blood of the Lord. 
But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means they're dead, not just taking a nap. <laughs> so some had abused this. They were uh, in sin, and they had unconfessed sin in their hearts, and they were you know, taking the elements of Christ's you know, the Lord's Supper, saying that Christ's blood was shed for me, even though I openly deny that with my actions. Okay? Christ said, and, and Paul said, as a result, some had suffered the consequences. So we want to uh, make sure. So the Lord's Supper, let's, let's just look at about six things about the Lord's Supper before we take it. Uh, the Lord's Supper is a memorial observation. Okay? It says, this do in remembrance. It's a memorial. You know, you know what a memorial is? To remember something. You know, if you go to... Uh, National Park in America, there's a so-and-so memorial. You know, that means it's a it's a statue used or some some edifice that reminds you of something that happened okay, a long time ago. It's a reminder. So it's a memorial. It's a reminder of what Christ did for us. Okay? And then it's a symbolic observation. It's symbolic. It's not literal. These uh, elements don't become the body of Christ and become the blood of Christ, as Catholics uh, teach in transubstantiation, and then the Lutherans teach in consubstantiation. Um, they say they become the body of Christ and become the, the, the blood of Christ. But that, and so, it, you know, Luther, he was, he didn't believe in transubstantiation, he didn't believe it literally became the body of Christ, but it symbolically became the body of Christ. And so, no, it's just a symbol that, that represents the body of Christ. It is not literally the body of Christ. You know, Christ said, I am the bread of life. He wasn't saying, I'm a loaf of bread, okay? <laughs> he said, I am the light of the world. He wasn't saying, I, I am the light, I can shine so you can see in the dark places. No, he said, I'm a door, and I'm a good shepherd, I'm the true vine. You know, he, he used those symbolism. Those are symbols, okay? And when he said, I'm the door, that means that through him we get to God, you know? And no, nobody comes to God except through Christ. And so he's the way, he's the door, he's the one we have to go through. And he's symbolically a door, not literally a door. And so he's symbolically the bread and the wine, not literally in the bread and the cup. Okay. And then, uh, number three, the Lord's Supper is in a continuing observation. It says, as oft as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you should adore the Lord's death until he comes in. As oft. Now, the Bible doesn't specify how often. Some churches take it every week. And I think that kind of becomes, you know, commonplace and you sort of doesn't it robs it of meaning you know it's like oh sort of again oh well i guess but, you know it's like so i think you should do it every time every week but you know some some you do it every month some do it every quarter that's the most common is every quarter you know four times a year in other words every three months uh, some do it every twice a year now we do it always on easter and we try to do it around new year's or, or, or christmas time too so we do it a couple times a year um, but whatever frequency we do it it is something we do every year. It's not like, we, okay, we did the Lord's Supper once. That's all we need to do is once. That's it. No, no, it's a continuing thing. A continuing thing. So, and then it's a church observation. So uh, the Corinth, Corinthians were written to the church at Corinth. So he was commanding the church at Corinth. He says, for I received this of the Lord. Like, I also delivered to you, to the Corinthian church. Okay, so it's an observation that he has given uh, the church to observe and to continue. And then it is a serious observation. It says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. So if you do it flippantly, guys, you know, and joke about it or just treat it lightly or know that you have sin in your heart, but you don't want to confess it and you don't want people to know, so you just take, no, don't do that. This is serious. It's a memorial of Christ's body, his blood that was shed for you. It's a serious thing. So let's take it seriously. And then finally, it is an exclusive observation. It's not for those who are not saved. Okay? Uh, the Bible says, that Paul said, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot partake in the Lord's table and the de table of devils. If you're not a Christian, you, you can't do this. Okay? Uh, if you're a Christian, you can't participate in the table of the devils, but you can't do this if you're not a Christian. So it's an exclusive observation. And so I hope you keep that in mind as we observe the Lord's Supper. All right.
In uh, Corinthians chapter um, 11, verse 23, it says um, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, he took, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat it, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this observation that you've given us to remind us what Christ has done for us, and remind us that we are uh, reci recipients of, of your grace, your mercy, your recipients of your sacrifice. And we thank you for what you've done for us. Your body was broken for our sins in our place for us. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. goes on in verse 25 of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. After the same manner, also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this in remembrance. This do, ye, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink this, the, the bread and drink the cup, you shew the Lord's death till he come. Father, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you that he suffered and died on the cross to pay the penalty of my sin. He was hanging there paying for my sins and his blood was shed for my sins. And I thank you so much for that. And I thank you for this memorial cup that you've given us to give us a physical remembrance of the spiritual truth and the physical truth that Christ literally shed his blood for us. Thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, and then the Bible says they sang a song and went out. So let's close uh, by singing number 376.